So I hope you had a chance to review some of your notes from last week. We introduced the topic of intermolecular forces. We discussed that there are, well, three major ones for now because we're not talking about solutions yet, but we have what we call dipole-dipole forces that are only possible between substances that have polar molecules. We talked about London dispersion forces which are created by temporary dipoles generated by the distortions in the electron clouds of molecules. And we said that those are very weak, but they are additive. In other words, for molecules that are fairly large, where the electron clouds are easily distorted, or molecules that are very distended, where there's a lot of opportunity for surface-to-surface -surface contact between molecules, you know, those uh, forces can add up and become fairly significant. And then we had a special case of the dipole-dipole force, which we call the hydrogen bond. We said it's only available to molecules that have covalently bonded you know, hydrogen with fluorine, with oxygen, or with nitrogen. But don't forget that even though we call it a hydrogen bond, the hydrogen bond itself is not the covalent bond of the hydrogen with other atoms in the molecule, but rather the attraction across space between molecules that have this property, all right? So please make sure you review that and do some practice. And one of the things we discussed was that several properties, particularly of liquids, uh, can be traced to the relative strengths of their intermolecular forces. So let's go back to uh, where we were last week. And this is, I believe, where we were. We were talking about some of the uh, properties of liquids that are gonna be significant to us, correct? And surface tension, viscosity, capillary action, formation of a meniscus, and the vapor pressure. Last time we discussed the boiling point. We talked about how the boiling point is a good indicator when we compare, let's say two different liquids and their relative boiling points, it is a good predictor, a good indicator of the strengths of the intramolecular forces for that particular substance. And we saw that, again, the stronger the intramolecular forces, the higher the boiling point or vice versa. If a substance exhibits a boiling point higher than another one, we can probably predict that it must be experiencing stronger intermolecular forces and therefore requires more energy and as a consequence, a higher temperature to vaporize. it. Today, we're gonna to start by looking at some of the other properties. Uh, some of these, I have some videos for them. I'm able to show them here. I may have to refer you to our Canvas page to look at them. Uh, let's see, at all of it depends on how my computer and internet connection are behaving today. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about surface tension. Like it says in here, the surface tension is the amount of energy required to stretch or increase the surface of a liquid by a unit area. What I'm showing here in these pictures are little droplets of liquid mercury. If you had grown up in my day and time, we used to love playing with mercury because it was so cool the way it formed these really tight little droplets, like almost like little beads, and you can roll them around and stuff like that. It was really cool. Uh, I guess little did we know at the time that mercury is toxic and we shouldn't have been playing with it, but maybe that explains a lot of my issues uh, in the future. Anyway, that's, that's a different story. Anyway, let's say that I could take a look at the nanoverse, you know, the atomic world here on the right. And let's say those spheres you see there are the atoms of mercury. Remember that in mercury, the type of force that holds atoms together is something we have called a metallic bond, which is achieved by the pooling of uh, valence uh, electrons across the whole <clears throat> three dimensions of the metal atoms. Notice that for a atom that is in the interior of that drop, there are 
forces attracting that atom in all directions. However, for those on the surface, the major force of attraction is towards the interior and towards the sides. So what that does is it causes the atoms on the edge of the drop to compress. And if that attraction force is strong enough, it's going to create a drop that is incredibly tight, very beaded. And uh, you'll see the difference between that and a substance that has weak intermolecular forces where the droplets don't take any particular shape. They're more or less kind of spread out. And so we can see that strong intermolecular forces go with a high surface tension. <clears throat> surface tension is a very important property for different things. Let's consider uh, water versus a substance called benzene, C6H6. And don't worry about the units, just look at the dimensions. It's telling you there that essentially water has a surface tension that's like, you know, like two and a half times uh, the surface tension of benzene. And if we know the structure of benzene, we'll know that benzene is capable only of weak London dispersion forces, whereas we know that water is capable of the stronger hydrogen bonding forces. <clears throat> So again, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the greater the surface tension will be. You can alter this by raising the temperature of the liquid because remember, temperature has to do with the average kinetic energy of molecules. Higher temperature means more average kinetic energy, increased molecular motion, which therefore kind of weakens the attraction forces and allows you to quote unquote stretch the surface of the liquid. You may remember when we did the experiment on titration, I may have explained that at some point, letting the burette simply drip into your reaction mixture might give you inaccuracy because as water droplets start forming a drop, there is a force that wants to hold the molecules of water together. It resists the pull of gravity until the drop of water is big enough that gravity wins and the drop falls down. By which time the size of the drop might cause you to overshoot your endpoint in the titration. I don't know if you remember this, but I, I remember doing that explanation, which is why when we're approaching the end point of the titration, instead of letting the water drip on its own by the force of gravity, we take the valve of the burette and we do a quick 180 turn to essentially push out a micro drop of liquid into the reaction mix. Well, the formation of drops of water, for example, as they come out of a faucet, is an example of surface tension. Water has a huge surface tension compared to other liquids. And so as it starts falling down from its source, whether it's the tip of the burette or the opening in your faucet, it's going to resist even the pull of gravity until the drop becomes too big and gravity wins over. Surface tension is also something interesting because you could think of the surface of water with all of this network of hydrogen bonding between the molecules as some kind of a skin, which is why you can sometimes float metallic objects like a paper clip. Try it at home. Take a cup of water, fill it with, you know, with water, and then very carefully put a small piece of paper towel on top and then lay down a paper clip on it. Then with a sharp object, like maybe like a pen or something, slowly push down, slowly and carefully push down on the paper towel and you'll see that the paper clip stays afloat unless you disturb the uh, uh, position of it. And so it's kind of like a little more on its side, in which case the thinner bar of metal will kind of penetrate in between the uh, network of hydrogen bonding of the water. Like I said, I have a few uh, interesting videos that I'm going to put on uh, Canvas that you can watch about this. All right. 
Okay, the next property we wanna discuss about liquids is viscosity, which we could define as the resistance to flow. This not being a physics course, I'm not gonna give you units. I just want you to think viscosity as a property of how easily a liquid flows or doesn't flow. If you wanna get a visual, imagine comparing the flow of you know, water or apple juice from a cup at breakfast time versus the flow of pancake syrup uh, when you're trying to pour it down. You can see how the uh, water flows a lot easier than the pancake syrup. You can also think of maybe uh, your you know, olive oil that you use to cook or to put on your salads or whatever versus say, say vinegar, which is an aqueous solution. So essentially, uh, liquids that have very low viscosity, in other words, liquids that flow very easily out of a container, typically are small symmetrical molecules with weak intermolecular forces. Carbon tetrachloride is an example of a molecule that is nonpolar. It's very small. And so liquid carbon tetrachloride has very low viscosity. On the other hand, liquids with high viscosity typically are large, uh, molecules or unsymmetrical molecules that has strong intermolecular forces. I'm showing you here a molecule of octadecane. As you can see from the size of it, it is a very long chain of carbon-carbon bonds with their entourage of hydrogens. Obviously, being nonpolar, it's only capable of, right, right, London dispersion forces, but also because of its elongated shape, it is able to essentially, through surface to surface contact, make these kind of stacks of one molecule against the other one, interacting through these London dispersion forces that, you know, on a per interaction basis are very small and very weak. But if you add it over the whole surface of that molecule, it can get pretty significant. Although octadecan is not what we consider an oil, it is part of that family of carbon containing compounds, the hydrocarbons that are capable of these you know, intermolecular forces uh, and therefore create liquids that are fairly viscous. So that's the property of viscosity. Again, the stronger the intermolecular attractive forces, the higher the liquid's viscosity will be. Another interesting thing is the shapes of the molecules. Spherical molecules typically have low viscosities for several reasons. Remember, London dispersion forces are not very strong. So molecules in a liquid are going to roll past each other more easily if they have spherical shapes. Besides, if you compare the surface to surface contact uh, between, let's say, an extended a molecule like the one we just saw here on the bottom, the octadecane versus a spherical model, the surface to surface contact area is a lot less and therefore you have less opportunity for these intermolecular attractions, all right? Uh, just like with surface tension, high temperature can affect viscosity. Again, next time you wanna try it at home, do what I do is I take my, I like my syrup a little warm, so what I'll do is I'll take my syrup and I'll put it in the microwave for a few seconds. And what is interesting when you pour it now, it's a lot more, I don't know, I don't know what the word is. It's less viscous. We call it more watery kind of thing. It pours a little easier. So I kind of like it like that. But anyway, just wanted to let you know that temperature affects viscosity for the same reason it affects surface tension. Higher kinetic energy of molecules gets in the way of these weak intermolecular attractions. And so the molecules kind of like turn a little more loose off of each other than if they were at low temperature. All right, here is another property, capillary action. It's the ability of a liquid to flow up a thin tube against the influence of gravity. The narrower the tube, the higher the liquid rises. Now, you know, in these days where people are concerned about their health, you may have had at some point a uh, lab test and they took blood out of you this way. They 
punch a little hole in your finger. Ouch. And then they put a small capillary tube and you can see the blood going very quickly up that tube. That is what is called capillary action, all right? The reason capillary action happens is because there are two forces that are working in conjunction, cohesive and adhesive forces. So cohesive force are the forces holding the liquid molecules together. In other words, these are the intermolecular attractive forces between the molecules of the liquid. For example, in the case of water, that would be hydrogen bonding mostly. Adhesive forces are the forces that attract the outer liquid molecules to the tube's surface. In other words, this is an interaction that may or may not be the same kind as the intermolecular forces acting between the liquid molecules, but these are the interactive forces between the liquid molecules and the surface of the tube. And sometimes what happens is those forces are strong enough that, of course, the molecules that are right on the surface of the liquid, they kind of attach to the liquid. But then the ones that are kind of like right behind uh, start kind of climb a little bit over them so they can get to the surface of the container or the test tube or the tube, I'm sorry, the capillary tube. Uh, Kind of like, you know, the groupies at a rock concert climbing over each other to try to get on the stage and touch the feet or, I don't know, the guitar cable of the uh, rock stars or whatever, something like that. So the adhesive forces pull the surface liquid up the side. But remember, the cohesive forces are pulling the liquid molecules back into the liquid. And so what's going to happen, you have a competition here. So initially, the liquid's going to rise up the tube, but at some point, the overall weight of that liquid up there is pulled down by the force of gravity, and so that causes the liquid to stay at that height. Notice the three capillary tubes on the bottom here. Notice that the middle one is a little uh, thicker. The one on the right and the one on the left are a lot narrower and you can see where the liquid is able to climb a little higher because it can reach that height before gravity starts pulling it back down and holds it in place, all right? Capillary action is also responsible for the action of many absorbent materials. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna switch over here Let's see if I can get us to this video. And I see if I can make it work. As I was saying earlier on, I was having a hard time with some of our uh, videos here. So we're going to try to watch this. Oops, sorry. I'll be right back. Hold on a second. I can do this. I can do this. Okay, here we go again. Okay, here we go. <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm. Okay, let's see if we can watch this without any interruptions in the internet. And if not, I'll put it on uh, Canvas later. I thought we'd have a little fun here. So let's have a little fun. Have you ever wondered how paper towels absorb water? Are you baffled by their magic liquid holding ability? Does questioning the physical laws of the universe leave you baffled? Today on A Moment of Science, how paper towels absorb water. moment of science. Hi, Mandy Strife here and have I got a moment of science for you. Paper towels. They absorb water, soda, suspicious blue liquid, any liquid you throw at them. But how? Unlike other leading absorption materials, paper, wood, cotton, and most other plants are made up of cellulose fibers. The secret is cellulose's porous structure and sugar molecules which have the opposite polarity of water. First, all the tiny spaces in the cellulose fibers fill with water. Then, the positive ends of the water molecules attract to the negative ends of the sugar molecules, just like when sugar dissolves into coffee. Once the sugar molecules are bonding to the water rather than each other, the fibers in the towel are weaker against ripping. See, if you try to absorb something that isn't bound to water, like oil, the paper towel will get wet, but it won't rip apart as easily as it will in water. 
Just look at how absorption makes these paper towels completely incapable of holding up this pile of marbles. You cannot hold up marbles around the house, at the office, or even on the go. And if you pay attention within the next few seconds, we'll even explain capillary action. Capillary action is the way water is pulled up into the paper towel. Water molecules are more attracted to the cellulose molecules than they are to each other. It's how plants pull water up out of the ground. Understand today. I'm Mandy Strife, and this has been a Moment of Science. Okay, I thought we'd have some fun, right? Why not? Why not have some fun, all right? Okay, uh, let's talk about another property. Oops, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I uh, forgot to put down my microphone here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I figured we'd have a little fun. There's a couple more that I'm going to put on Canvas. Some of them are a little old. And as you can see, sometimes the pixelation kind of doesn't work in our favor. So, okay, so let's look here again at our, what we're talking about, PowerPoint. We're back on here. And let's talk about another property of liquids, and that is the formation of a meniscus. Yes, that annoying property of water that makes it hard to read the volume on a graduated cylinder and uh hey did you guys do okay on those questions in the test i don't know sometimes i i, I get concerned about putting pictures in tests and them not coming out too well but i'm open to feedback if you was gonna be by the way the uh test is graded so hopefully you can go in there and go question by question and see how you did okay and again if you have any concerns if you have any reason to think that something got graded wrong, remember Dr. DA's customer service policy, right? You basically write out what your concern is or your request for revision. You send it to me. In this case, probably best thing to do is to put a message in the inbox in Canvas. Okay, so how does a meniscus form? Well, it has to do with the same properties that create capillary action. If you look at the image here on the left, you can see how water, for example, has a stronger attraction for the surface of the glass than for its own molecules. That means that the molecules of water that are at the very boundary, at the interface with the surface of the glass are kind of climbing over each other to get to interact with that more attractive force, which is the interior of the glass tube. And that's how those molecules, by climbing up, generate this concave, I don't know, downward curved meniscus, I guess that's what we would call it. If we were still allowed to play with mercury, of course we don't, but if we could, we would notice something interesting, and it is that mercury forms a convex meniscus. In other words, it's kind of like it curves upward instead of downwards. And you can see in the image on the right that what is happening is that in this case, the liquid has less attraction for the glass than for its own molecules. So, uh, and it's going to say, it says molecules here, but remember in the case of mercury, uh, these would be atoms. And again, the force that holds them together is a very strong metallic bond. And essentially what it causes is it causes the atoms there on the surface to pull away from the surface of the glass, generating a net convex meniscus. All right. So there you have it. These are some of the important properties that we have. And uh, for the next few minutes, I'm going to focus then on a very important one. Uh, not because it's more important than these ones, but maybe because it's one that's going to be the basis for the lab you're going to be doing, not this week, but next week, and that is the vapor pressure. Although, actually, there will be some discussion of vapor pressure in this week's lab activity also. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about this. For a few moments, let me pick a point where we're going to do a little break here. Yes, okay, let's do this. So let's say that you have the experience of putting a glass of 
water on top of your bench or other beverage. And then coming back, forgetting totally about it, and coming back a couple hours later and realizing that about half the water is gone. No, your little sister didn't steal it and drink it. Your dog didn't jump on the table and laugh at it. No, no. What happened was vaporization. Remember that over the range of the gazillion molecules that are in a sample of a liquid, you have a distribution of kinetic energies that is random, right? What is holding the molecules together in the liquid state is intermolecular forces. But realize that for the molecules that are on the surface, those intermolecular forces are only pulling towards the liquid, but above that surface, there's just open air. And so it may be that some of those energy at some point may accumulate high enough energy that they can overcome the attractive forces. You know, typically the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of evaporation. In other words, the more molecules of water that are exposed to air, the faster it's going to evaporate. That's why sometimes when you're trying to dry a floor or something, uh, the mop goes only so far in terms of picking up water. Most, a lot of what happens is that the water gets spread out into a thin layer that evaporates a little faster, right? So what happens to these molecules that accumulate enough energy at some point just randomly in time? Well, they can escape the liquid and become a vapor. Now let's say that instead of an open container, like a glass, or in this case, a beaker of water, I put the liquid in a closed container and I allow it to sit there at constant temperature for a while, okay? Notice that what's gonna happen here is, as you go here from left to right, you're gonna have initially just the liquid. A small fraction of the molecules will have enough energy at any given point that they will escape the intermolecular forces that attract them in the liquid state and essentially escape into the gas state, right? Sometimes, remember, when we're talking about a substance where it has two physical states kind of like next to each other, we call them phases. So we call the liquid phase and the vapor phase, right? Now, as the process continues, every now and then, some of these molecules will come back and collide with the surface of the liquid. Many times they'll bounce if they have enough energy, but if at the moment they collide, they have lost some of that energy just randomly or because they had already collided with the surface of the container with other molecules, they might actually get basically pulled back in to the liquid. And so we call this process condensation. As time goes on, you can see how the, what started out as purely evaporation now starts also being accompanied by condensation, all right? These are opposite processes. Remember, if the container were open, those vapor phase molecules would have plenty of room to escape and by their random motion as described by the kinetic molecular theory, they would simply disperse. They, they would diffuse out into the air. But since in this case, they don't have anywhere to go, condensation starts taking a more uh, prominent role. And after a while, what you're gonna see is that at some point, the rate of condensation is going to equal, there on the right, the rate of vaporization. All right, remember, okay, it doesn't mean that you have the same number of molecules in each phase. All it's saying is that liquid is vaporizing at the same rate that vapor is condensing. The actual amounts don't have to be the same, but the point is that you've established something that's called a dynamic equilibrium. This is when two opposite processes reach the same rate. And so what happens is there is no net gain or loss of material on either uh, phase. 
So we call it a dynamic equilibrium. The processes have not stopped. Liquid is still vaporizing. Vapor is still condens condensing. But what happens is that they're doing it at the same rate. Like it says here, it doesn't mean that there are equal amounts of vapor and liquid. What it means is that they're changing by equal amounts. And you can see in the graph, if you were to measure the rate of each process over time, initially you simply have evaporation happening, but as vapor molecules begin to condense, the rate of condensation increases and you reach a point after which you have this so-called dynamic equilibrium. Now, let's say that I could do this. Let's say that I could somehow measure the pressure that's in that vapor phase in there, right? Remember, what did we say the pressure of a gas is the result of? Right, it's the result of the gas molecules colliding against the surface of the container. If we had a way of measuring what those collisions are, we basically would have collisions against the wall of the container. Also remember, against the surface of liquid. Collisions against the surface of liquid sometimes result in the molecule getting trapped again in the liquid state, or they might just bounce off and generate a pressure on the surface of the liquid. Because of that, the pressure inside the vapor phase of this container, we're gonna call it the vapor pressure of the liquid. This is gonna be a very important physical property. And the reason why it's so important is because think about this. Since pressure depends on what? Volume, temperature, and the amount of material, the number of molecules, right? The volume here is constant because we're keeping the container closed and we're in a glass container that doesn't expand significantly. We said we're doing this at constant temperature. So in other words, the thing that's gonna affect this vapor pressure will be the number of molecules that are in the vapor phase. What does that have to do with our study? Well, remember, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the less likelihood of liquid molecules basically escaping into the gas phase because they're getting held into the liquid state or phase by stronger forces. And since stronger intermolecular forces give me less liquid molecules in the vapor phase now, what's going to happen is you're going to have a lower vapor pressure. Okay, everybody see that? So it's like an inverse relationship. Stronger intermolecular forces, lower vapor pressure. Now, how would we measure that pressure? Well, I'm going to show you just a sketch. Again, this is the, doesn't have to be the way we do it. And as a matter of fact, we are going to do an experiment for activity, a lab activity, where we will essentially measure the vapor pressure of water at different temperatures. So let's say that I start out with a container on the left. I have the liquid, there's no empty space, but I've attached it to a U-shaped column, column that has mercury in it. Before evaporation, since there's no pressure on the space above the liquid nor on the little vacuum on the right side of the U-shaped tube, the two sides of the mercury column are equal in height. As the liquid begins to vaporize, you can see how vapor molecules will start exerting a pressure on the left side of the U-shaped tube. And as they push the mercury down, since on the right side, there's nothing to hold it back because it's a vacuum, you essentially now have a difference in height between the two columns of mercury. That difference height can be read in millimeters of mercury, in other words, in tor, and that is how you can find out what is the vapor pressure of the liquid. Now what you do is you repeat this experiment at different temperatures and you plot no. the vapor pressure of the liquid 
at different temperatures. All right. And that's what we're going to discuss next. And let's take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, we will discuss these vapor pressure curves and other types of graphs that we're going to be doing. All right. Let's take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene at, let's say, 2.05. All right. See you soon. Let us continue our discussion here. Let's pick up where we left off. I'm going to go back to our screen here. And if I can find where we were, here we go. This is one of several types of graphs that we're going to be covering in this unit. This is what's called a vapor pressure curve. Following the procedures that I described on the previous slide, you can graph what is the vapor pressure of a liquid at different temperatures. And here are the vapor pressure curves for four different liquids. So immediately, one of the things that would stand out is, of course, they are not the same. For example, if I were to draw a line here where the 25 degree temperature is, you can see that at 25 degrees, the vapor pressure of water based on this graph is very, very small, somewhere in the 20, 20 to 30 torr kind of range. Notice ethyl alcohol has a higher vapor pressure at 25 degrees. And this substance, diethyl ether, has a much, much higher vapor pressure. So as we mentioned earlier, the vapor pressure of a liquid at a certain temperature is an indicator of the relative strength of its intermolecular forces. So in this case, we would say that because diethyl ether has a much higher vapor pressure, at 25 degrees, that tells you that at 25 degrees, a much, much larger number of molecules of a sample diethyl ether have gone into the gas phase, and that's why you have a much higher pressure, which means, therefore, that the forces that were holding those molecules in the liquid state were not as strong as the forces that were holding the molecules of ethyl alcohol or water in the liquid. So just like the surface tension, just like the viscosity, just like the boiling point gives us a window into the relative strengths of intermolecular forces of liquids, so does the vapor pressure. Now the other thing we can do here is if we look at that horizontal line there around the 760 tor pressure, notice that whenever a vapor pressure curve crosses that horizontal line, we have listed there the temperatures at which that happens. So for diethyl ether is 34.6 Celsius, for ethyl alcohol 78.3, and for water 100. Notice what we're saying is this is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid, that is the pressure of the vapor phase above the surface of the liquid equals the pressure of the atmosphere. And that is what we call essentially the normal boiling point. This is when the vapor pressure of a liquid equals 760 torr or one atmosphere of pressure. Notice that this is a different way of looking at what the boiling point is. Because we used to look at the boiling point as, oh, this is the temperature at which the liquid becomes uh, gas and the temperature stops increasing in the liquid. This is a whole different way of looking at it. So we are going to say, as a second definition, that 
The boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. Remember, if the external pressure is one atmosphere or 760 torr, we would call it more precisely the normal boiling point. Now, what is the significance of this? Remember, the whole process of vaporization was based on the idea that molecules on the surface of the liquid might at some point have a distribution of kinetic energy that allows them to escape the intermolecular forces that kept them in the liquid phase. But that was only for those molecules on the surface of the liquid. When you reach the boiling point, essentially, since the vapor pressure is the same as the external pressure, now what you can have is that any molecule of the liquid anywhere on the sample is capable of vaporizing, not just the ones on the surface of the liquid. And because of that, as you can see in the little picture above and the uh, zoom into the molecular world there, what happens is these molecules that vaporize, like in the, let's say, bottom portion of the sample, because they go into the gas phase and the gas phase is less dense, they essentially push their way out into the form of bubbles, which because of their lower density then float until they reach the surface, at which point the pressure inside the bubble is equal to the pressure outside and so they burst. So whenever you see bubbling happening like this, from the application of heat, you've reached the boiling point, the temperature of the vapor phase equals, I'm sorry, the pressure of the vapor phase equals the pressure of the atmosphere. Now, we said that the normal boiling point is when that vapor pressure of the liquid is one atmosphere. But remember, that is only under certain conditions. We've pretty much determined or decided or defined one atmosphere as the pressure of air at sea level, right, at elevation zero. But we don't have to limit it to that, those conditions. What if, for example, we were to be at a lower external pressure? Well, since the boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals that external pressure, then that means that a lower external pressure, you're going to have a lower boiling point. Here is a table that gives you the boiling point of water at several locations. Uh, in the bottom there you have, I don't know why they chose Boston, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> of course, that's sea level, that's elevation zero, where we've defined that the approximate boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius for one atmosphere of pressure. If you were to go a mile high, like Denver, Colorado, notice that the boiling point drops to 94 as the approximate air pressure drops to 0.83. It's thinner air. Up here in California is Mount Whitney. Mount Whitney is about a little under 14,500 feet high. At that altitude, the approximate pressure is 0 0.6 atmospheres. And notice how the boiling point of water is at 87. So this is very significant in the sense that, remember, the boiling point of a liquid is the highest temperature you're going to be able to reach for that liquid because once you get to that temperature, the liquid begins to vaporize and there's no more liquid. So for example, if you're trying to hard boil an egg. We normally you know, boil the water. We put the egg in boiling water until it, it cooks inside. Notice that if the water is boiling already at 80 something degrees, it might take a while for that egg to cook inside because the temperature is gonna be lower, right? So. Uh, this is very important. So the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point. So remember, stronger intermolecular forces means less molecules going into the vapor phase, which means lower vapor pressure, which now means you're going to have to put more, more energy to get the number of molecules to increase in the gas phase 
so that that pressure can equalize the atmospheric pressure or the external pressure. So you're gonna have a higher temperature at that point or a higher boiling point. Uh, just wanted to remind you of something when we talk about these things about what temperature does to the intermolecular force attractions of molecules. Be careful with using the expression, oh, we need energy to break down the molecules. Be very careful with that expression because it is not correct. Typically, the word break down molecules means that you're breaking the covalent bonds that are intramolecular to the substance. What we are breaking down here is not the covalent bonds. What we are breaking here is the intermolecular attractive forces between molecules, all right? So be careful with using, how you use the phrase break down, all right? So you don't give the impression that you're talking about the covalent points. Okay, so we have been introduced here to what's called a vapor pressure curve, all right? So let's go ahead and look at other types of curves. <laughs> let's start out with what we call the heating curve. And we're gonna specify the heating curve of a liquid. Hopefully you remember that one of the first lab activities we did, and this was before we went to remote instruction, was drawing out the heating curve of a solid. So we had a solid that was being heated, the temperature increased until it kind of leveled off, and we said that is where melting is happening, where you're having a back and forth, which now we call a dynamic equilibrium between the melting of the solid or the freezing of the liquid. Let's focus on the heating curve of a liquid. Starting here on the left, we start with a liquid at room temperature and we start adding heat. And as you can see, the line starts rising with a certain slope because the temperature is increasing. During that stage of the heating process, we have a formula that allows us to calculate what is the amount of heat that is being added, all right? We have it right here. Remember our famous MCAT formula? So during this stage here, where the temperature is increasing, we use that formula there, the MCAT formula. Of course, we need to know what the specific heat of the particular liquid is. Now, what happens is you reach the boiling point. At that temperature, all of the heat that you're adding is not being used to increase the kinetic energy of those liquid molecules. It's actually being used to break up the interactions between one molecule and another one. In other words, it's going all into vaporization. Because of that, the average kinetic energy of the liquid molecules does not increase, and therefore the temperature remains constant. And this was the other way that we used to calculate or to find out what was the boiling point of a substance. So this is another way of calculating it. Now notice that once the liquid has completely been converted into gas, now all you have is gas and so the temperature can start to rise again. Once more, you will use that MCAT formula but in this case, the specific heat portion, the C sub S, will be not for the liquid, but for the solid phase of the substance, all right? So the heating curve allows us to track and calculate the amount of heat required to transform X amount of liquid into, let's say, X amount of gas or vapor at a particular temperature. The one thing that we're missing here is how do you calculate the heat during the boiling phase here, the boiling stage? Because there is no uh, 
measurable change in temperature. So there's no MCAT formula you can apply there. Delta T equals zero. So for that, what we need is another uh, property. And this is called the molar heat of vaporization, delta HVAP. This would be the energy required to vaporize one mole of a liquid at its boiling point. Again, if we look at the uh, vapor pressure curves on the bottom, remember that the stronger the intermolecular forces, right, the lower the vapor pressure, and therefore also the lower the heat of vaporization. Let me say that again. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the lower the vapor pressure, I'm sorry, and therefore the more energy you're gonna to require to vaporize one mole of the substance. I apologize for that confusion there. So you can see where, for example, water has a much lower vapor pressure, let's say at 25 degrees, so in order to vaporize water, I'm gonna need more energy because I had to overcome stronger intermolecular forces than with diethyl ether. The heat of vaporization is a property that you measure by doing what is called a clausius clapeyron graph. We're gonna be doing this in a couple of weeks, but in the meantime, let me give you what the equation is. The clausius clapeyron equation, you can see it here. This is the natural log of P, where P is the equilibrium vapor pressure, minus delta HVAP, which is the heat of vaporization, divided by RT, where T is the temperature in Kelvin. And R is the gas constant, but, in this particular case, we're gonna take that PV product, that liters atmospheres, and we're gonna convert it into units of energy. Remember we said that the PV product is essentially a unit of work or energy. And in this case, the gas constant value is 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. Notice that these are different units now. All right. Well, you're in a batch. I'm Can I get you guys to uh, unmute? I mean, to mute your phones, please. Your microphone. Thank you. Now, look at the form of this equation. The form of this equation is the form of a straight line. Correct. If this is y. And this would be mx, oh, I can't do it here. My stylus is not working, sorry about that. But the point is that the uh, natural log of P would be the y, del minus delta H over R would be the slope. One over T, the reciprocal of the temperature would be the x. And C is a constant that we're not gonna deal with right now, it's just the intercept. So that means that you can draw a graph where you measure the vapor pressure of the liquid at different temperatures, and we have the graphs right here on the left, and you plot the natural log of the vapor pressure against the reciprocal of the absolute temperature, and yes, you get a straight line. And remember, the slope of this line, right? And let me see, I can get this thing to work this time. The slope of this line is going to be minus delta H VAP over R. Since R is a constant and the slope can be obtained from the equation of each one of these lines, you can calculate what is the value of delta H VAP. And that is essentially the way you do it. We're gonna do an experiment like this in a couple of weeks. 
We're going to do it for water. And hopefully we'll generate a straight line that looks like the one here for water. Notice that if you compare uh, water here on the left with the substance here, and this formula here corresponds essentially to diethyl ether, you can see where the slope of water is steeper. If the slope is steeper, that must mean that delta HVAP for water has to be a bigger value. And as predicted, yes, it takes more energy to vaporize a mole of water molecules than a mole of diethyl ether molecules. All right. Cool. Just like we have the molar heat of vaporization, we could go to the other side of that heating curve if we were to extend it and calculate the molar heat of fusion. This would be the energy required to melt one mole of a solid substance at its freezing point. Again, notice the values here for water, rubbing alcohol, acetone, diethyl ether. And uh, think about the, uh, well, we didn't discuss what they were, but we saw, I believe last week I showed you that the heat of vaporization of water is on the order of 40 something kilojoules per mole. That's the heat of vaporization of water. Notice the heat of fusion of water, six kilojoules per mole. I want you to think for a moment, why would the heat of fusion be on the overall trend smaller than the corresponding heats of vaporization. Well, yes, the answer is that when you transition from solid to liquid, yes, you are undoing some intermolecular forces, but it's not that huge a change. Remember, liquid molecules, although they are movable and you know, roll past each other, they're still in pretty close proximity. So the change in energy has not been that huge from a solid to a liquid. Whereas the change from liquid to gas is a major one. You're essentially making those molecules now completely free of any kind of intermolecular force attractions. So let's say that we were to combine the heating curve that we started out with at the beginning of the semester for a solid with the heating curve for a liquid, let's say water, and this is what you get. Uh, let's take a few moments to look at it again. We're plotting the temperature as we add heat to a sample. In this case, we started with solid ice at minus 25 degrees. You can see there on the left, and the blue line represents the heat that is added to bring the ice to zero degrees, which is its melting point. Stage number two would represent the melting of the ice. So all the energy that's being added in there, it says there's 6.02 kilojoules per mole. You can see here on the top. All of that energy now is being used to simply melt the ice. There's no net change in the kinetic energy. Once all the ice has become liquid, now you go to stage three where you are now heating the water and its temperature begins to increase again here in uh, stage number three. Again, that's going to follow the uh, MCAT formula. And depending on how much stuff we started with, I think we started with exactly one mole of substance here. You can see how there is a broad increase in temperature until you reach the boiling point. And remember, at the boiling point, what's gonna happen is any further energy that is added is gonna be used to simply vaporize the liquid water. There's no net increase in the kinetic energy of the water molecules. Notice that in order to boil all of that water, stage number four, it requires a lot more energy. As you can see here on top, roughly about 40.7 kilojoules per mole, whereas, when we're trying to melt the ice, it only required about six kilojoules per mole. And that's why that stage is a lot longer here on the graph. Finally, we arrive at the point where we 
vaporize all of the water in that sample. And now, of course, stage number five, steam begins to heat up. The temperature increases. Steam has a different specific heat than liquid water or ice. And so the amount of heat that is required here to take it to a target temperature is different. <clears throat> so I figure we would close today's discussion by doing a little practice exercise, which unfortunately might not have made it to your PowerPoint notes. I apologize for that. We're going to take a little tour here through a heating curve, but we're going to do it for calcium. So we're going to start with 65.25 grams of solid calcium at 651 degrees Celsius. And we are going to bring it up to liquid calcium at 951 degrees Celsius. And over here, I give you some information you're going to need, the melting point of calcium the specific heat capacities of both the solid and the liquid, and finally, the heat of fusion for calcium. <clears throat> Let me give you a few moments for you to write that down. Meanwhile, I'm going to set up our makeshift whiteboard over here so we can do this problem. Okay, a few more seconds for you to write that down. Again, I'm going to have it over here also. So let's go ahead and switch over here to our whiteboard. Over here. And here we go. Let's see if we can focus this a little bit better. Okay. All right. So here's the problem we're going to solve. So again, remember, we are looking at a curve where you're measuring temperature against heat added. You're starting at a solid at 651 degrees Celsius. Oops, I put it over here. Let me put it over here, 651 Celsius. We're gonna start heating it. Since the melting point is 851, that means that we had to go all the way to 851, at which point it's gonna start melting. And once it all has melted, we will then start increasing the temperature again until we get to 951. That's our final destination. All right, this is our melting here. This is our solid. And over here is our liquid. All right, so let's write out what is the heat for each one of these stages. So let's call this stage A, this is stage B, and this is stage C. Stage A is essentially just heating. So we're gonna use our MCAT formula, M delta C, oops, sorry, CS delta T. Sorry about that. So let's put in the values. We were told that we have 65.25 grams of calcium. Careful with what you choose for the specific heat. 
At this point, we're talking solid. So we got to use this one over here, 0 0.65 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Delta T is always final minus initial. So the final here is we're taking it all the way to when it's going to start melting. So that'll be 851 minus the starting one, 651. degrees Celsius. Okay, this is gonna be exactly 200, that's three sig figs, two sig figs here, so. Grams cancel out, Celsius cancel out. So this comes up to be 8,400, 82.5 joules yes we had to round it but remember we typically round at the end right so i'm going to save that in there for now okay stage b stage b there is no change in temperature delta t is zero we can't use this formula here this is melting and the heat here would be the number of moles of calcium times the heat of fusion for calcium all right how many moles of calcium do we have? Well, we have 65.25 grams. What is the molar mass of calcium? Got to look it up in your periodic table. Yep, 40.08. So one mole. 40.08 grams, cancel out the grams. And the heat of fusion is over here, 9.33 kilojoules per mole. So that cancels out the moles. Some students get confused when they see this here and they think, is that minus the delta H of fusion? Okay, think about it. Fusion means melting, right? It means that you're putting energy in to pull apart molecules from the solid to the liquid state. Is that positive or negative? Positive, right? It's, it's endothermic. Okay, and I think that comes up to be uh, something like, you know what I'm gonna do, guys? I'm gonna go ahead and take my calculator and start putting these things in. So the first one we had was eight, four, eight, two point five joules, but they want over here our answer in kilojoules. So I'm going to go ahead and convert that into kilojoules. So I'm going to divide that by 1,000. 8.4825. Now I'm going to put that in my Actually, I need to round that to 3 to 2 sig figs, right? Is that what that was? 2 sig figs. So that means that technically it's gonna be 8.5. In other words, one decimal, all right? All right, I'm gonna put it in here, put it in memory. Now I got this new number here. Okay, let's go ahead and say this is 65.25 divided by 40.08. 
That's the number of moles times 9.33 kilojoules per mole. So that's 15.189. Again, I have a limit here of three sig figs. So that's also going to be one decimal place, but I'm going to go ahead and put it in here. Memory. And now I'm going to go to stage number six. So whereas in stage A, I was heating the solid, by stage six, all of the solid has become liquid. So I'm going to be heating my liquid now. And again, this is going to be using the MCAT formula, but this is for the liquid, right? This up a little bit here. Uh, mass is conserved, so I still have 65.25 grams. Now, this is the specific heat for the liquid, which is 0 0.77. Notice that it's not the same number. Joules per gram per degree Celsius. And now the temperature is, I'm still starting at the melting point, 851, and I'm going to go to 951. So that's 951 minus 851 degrees Celsius, running out of room here, uh-oh, so let's see what that is, 951 minus 851 is 100, right, three sig fix, tres, times 0.77 times 65.25 equals 5,024.25. But remember, I could only hold two sig figs, I mean three, two sig figs from here. So that means that number is not going to have any uh, decimals. But what I'm going to do is, hold on, hold on, before I do that, hold on, hold on. I'm not done yet. I'm going to divide by 1,000 to get the kilojoules. So that's 5.02. So that's one decimal also because I only keep two sig figs here. I'm going to take that number and put it in memory. All right. So here's what I did. I calculated the heat that it took in moving the solid from its starting temperature to its melting point. But I had to convert that to kilojoules. I figure out what was the um, heat that it took to melt that amount of solid completely into liquid. And then I calculated what was the amount of heat required to bring now the liquid up to the final temperature of 951. And again, we converted that into kilojoules. And our grand total, when I added those up, I'm gonna pull it up here from my memory, is 28.69. But remember that all of these could only have one decimal. So 28.7. Kilojoules. I forget this was joules. This was kilojoules. So 28.7 kilojoules is what it takes to bring this amount of calcium from a solid at 651 to liquid at 951. 
So this is uh, one of the exercises you'll be doing in your homework. So now you have an idea of how to carry it out. There is a upcoming topic, which is our study of vapor pressures. And unfortunately, we are out of time right now. So what we will do is I am going to ask you to look for a video that's going to be posting in your Canvas page later today. I'm going to walk you through something called a face diagram. A face diagram is a diagram that shows all three of the physical states of a substance in a pressure versus temperature grid. There will be a video in there and then some examples that you'll be able to follow. The second thing I need you to do is I need you to go, again, when you go to your Canvas page, there's also going to be another video posted probably tomorrow. And this one is about the uh, structures of uh, solid crystals. I'm going to post that one. And what we'll do is we'll pick it up on Wednesday. We are going to transition from here to a brief study about properties of solids, in particular, crystalline solids, those that are packed in a very regular array of particles, okay?